Today we are on day three of our academy and we will be going over design tools, time and expense, tasks, timelines, and reporting. Um, but first and foremost, hopefully many of you have been with us this whole session and know who I am at this point. But my name is Chloe. If I haven't had the chance to say hello to you yet, I'm one of the directors here at House. I've been here for about eight years and I am so excited to talk to you today about House Pro, get you even more familiar with all these amazing tools. And I am joined by Chris Kincaid, uh, who's going to be our presenter today. So Chris, say hello, let them know a little bit about you. Hello. Yes. Uh, well, thank you for the introduction, Chloe. Uh, my name is Chris. I've been with House now for going on four years and I've been working in the client success division uh, since starting here. So I've been here as House has really evolved and integrated not only products from our software with IEV relationship, as well as the tools that we're building ourselves. Um, and it's just been really exciting to watch everything grow and develop and also be able to like take advice and, and feedback from uh, our pros and give it to our developers and watch things really materialize. Yeah, wonderful, all right. And then like I said, we have a lot of things in store for you today. So I'm really excited for Chris to walk through some tips and tricks on the 3D floor plan going over mood boards. Um, some design tools on what we, what we have on the roadmap is actually what we're going to end with. Um, I have some great updates to share with you, maybe a sneak peek on what's to come soon. And Chris is also going to go over time and expense tasks, um, some timeline and Gantt chart how to's as well as running reports. Um, but we want to continue to keep this as interactive as possible. So please do feel free to ask questions. You should see a Q&A option over the right hand side of your screen. Um, if anything is relevant for the whole audience, we will absolutely pause and share out. Um, but we want to make sure you get the most out of this as possible. So please do, don't hesitate to ask questions. Um, there are some already. This session will indeed be recorded and we will send it to you after the event. So don't even worry. Um, but we will go ahead and jump in and get started. So Chris, I will let you take it away. Yeah, so let's get it started. We're going to begin with our 3D floor plan tool at House, And um, just to kind of quickly do an overview before we begin working on a floor plan, um, the first thing that you're going to want to do just when navigating into House Pro is selecting the design tab. And underneath design, the 3D floor plan option is the first one. Um, we'll be starting with design software. So 3D floor plan and mood boards will be the first two things that we kind of look at. And once you click 3D floor plans, um, there's a few things that you'll begin to see. The first is the add a floor plan section. So this is, you know, this spot as well as the new floor plan button are where you're going to go in and originate the floor plan. Uh, and then any floor plan that you've ever done on house, as long as you haven't gone in through and deleted it, will also appear here. So these are um, past ones, but you can always kind of keep a list of other pro of other floor plans in this section. Um, but the first thing we're going to do here is just go ahead and add a plan. So once you click that, it does open a new tab. Um, there's no back button. It just simply opens this tab and creates it standalone from the House Pro. And this is where you can begin to make your um, edits and, and begin working on the plan. So to begin, um, I typically like to look at this or explain it as both kind of a, a top down, looking at different features up here, as well as uh, on down through this section. So just to kind of begin, the first thing here is that you can begin it with a title. So uh, living room floor plan or kitchen or whatever it is, you can go ahead and put that in. And then beyond that, um, there's a couple nav bars here. So to speak to that a little bit, the first one is our 2D floor plan. Um, this is something that you can adjust. So if you were going off of meters instead of feet or something, you can make adjustments to the way that the floor plans originate. Um, but the floor plan itself just populates with the rectangle right here. Um, after that floor plan view is a dollhouse view. This is more of a bird's eye uh, interactive view of this. One question I actually often get is if these can be converted into PDFs. Um, we do have the ability on a floor plan to click actions and, and do some of that. Um, but because this is such an interactive tool, um, you actually would share this as a file, which we'll speak about here in a second. And then, or as a uh, link. And then the next thing here is our walkthrough. Uh, the walkthrough is very impressive. I think this is the one that leaves the most lasting impression with your clients, if I'm being honest, because it really gives you a very 
uh, very precise and, and detailed look inside the space. Uh, and not only does it kind of pivot you in the center of the room to begin, um, but you can actually move around the space. And on bigger floor plans, it allows you the ability to actually walk through or simulate a walkthrough through the whole, the whole uh, floor or whatever you're working on. So beyond that, um, we do have an actions button. Actions is very handy just because it's a great place to kind of uh, either launch with a new plan. Um, duplicate is one I see very commonly used by designers. And ultimately, that allows you to duplicate a, a floor plan. Uh, many times, a, the design itself or the, the bones or structure will be put in place. And then that will be duplicated in case they want to offer different layouts or things like that within the plan itself. And then beyond that, this is that share button I mentioned. Sharing allows you to create a shareable link, which then can be copied and sent to your clients. Um, when they open that link up, it allows them to also see the floor plan, dollhouse, and walkthrough views. And then beyond that, these are just if you needed to load a previous floor plan, or you can also click to save. One very handy tool is that this will autosave for itself, and it will do so very regularly. Um, but in case you want to do any manual saves, this blue button will be your uh, choice for that. So that's kind of just looking up at this top section. And the next thing I want to look and highlight is going to be some of these buttons here. So the first one, and by default, is select. Select is going to be a fantastic tool for if you need to alter or make adjustments to, say, a product. Um, or if you just need to highlight and, say, select a wall, if you need to make changes to dimensions. Um, things of that nature, select clicking on the floor to allow flooring. Those are sort of some of the, the primary features and, and reasons this select button is so important. Um, but after that, we have our drawing walls. So if you need to create a space that is a little bit larger, you need to add walls. Um, or if maybe this space isn't really a true rectangle, there's a there's a you know something over here that kind of actually is more of this shape and kind of cuts into the, the wall. You can add on walls how you need by clicking this button. And then if this space should actually be removed, you can highlight by clicking. Again, it defaults back to select and will allow us to delete these little sections off. These are just, again, preference based, but most, uh, most designers would be operating out of Imperial. So it's going to always be by default in feet. And then over here are just some other pieces for zooming in, zooming out. Um, many times your mouse can achieve the same function uh, if you have like a rolling mouse, but uh, these buttons are up there for that reason. And one other one that I actually wanted to highlight that's very important, especially on larger floor plans, is this zoom to center. Um, as a plan can get four or five, six rooms added into it. Um, sometimes this button just makes it easier to kind of snap back to a origination plan or point and operate from there. Um, the only other things I wanted to touch on really quickly were this un was the undo button. This one is fantastic if you're like me and sometimes will make mistakes throughout your floor plan. Click undo. It just takes away what you've done. Um, and then redo obviously will just um, put your changes back into place. But that's what these two buttons are going to help you with. And then over here are the probably the most important aspects of our floor plan tools, which is our structures, products, and sources. So to begin, structure is always the most important um, aspect in terms of getting the, the room and everything to look correct. Um, and if you're doing it on a desktop using measurements, I generally would advise to just click on our walls and make additions or adjustments to the dimensions right here. You can switch wall side in case you need to make a change to the exterior wall, but this measurement is always going to give you the interior wall dimension. So you'll see that dimension highlighted right here, uh, and that's the one that you're going to be making adjustments on based on your measurements. And then you can also adjust things like the thickness of the wall if needed. The other piece of this that is very handy is ceiling height. Now, typically in structures, the majority of what you're doing is in this floor plan view. Ceiling height is one where it does help to go to dollhouse um, just to kind of see the changes in what you're doing. So when I say that, I mean, if we're trying to make our walls a little taller, our render doesn't provide an actual ceiling. So the, the ceiling height is really giving us a little bit more verticality on our walls. Um, so if we actually had nine foot walls or 10 foot walls in a house, we would make that adjustment right here. And then you can kind of see the walls following that change. 
Um, so this is just, again, for the larger spaces, if you need to be able to show vertical shelving or things like that, um, it's really important to make sure that your layering's done right. And to be, the only way you can really do that is if your ceiling height is correct to begin with. So this is the only aspect, again, that I would ever really recommend working your structures from a uh, dollhouse view. The remaining of these, the remainder of these are all things that are, that are going to be easiest to tackle while in the floor plan. So just to kind of go top down, um, I find that to be the, to normally the easiest way to go through these. We have doors, windows, and now we also include staircases and indoor fireplaces. Uh, doors are going to be where we're starting. So if we click on a door, the first thing you're going to see is that we have a lot of renders. Um, I can't, I mean, maybe there's doors that exist that are outside of these, but we carry a very large variety of doors here, both interior, exterior, modern, traditional, sliding doors, all sorts of different examples um, exist. And if we want to click on a door, say if this corner here is a sliding door, um, if this was a kitchen and this is kind of an entry, entry outside type deal, we can go ahead and put it on the wall here. And once it fixes to a wall, you'll see that this door now has some different properties. Some of the things we can adjust are dimensions, height and width, as well as things like finishes. So it's a sliding door, maybe not, doesn't really have too much color on it, but things like are either a stain or paint colors. Um, we do have the catalog from Benjamin, uh, Benjamin Moore. So if we needed say white heron um, as a wall or as a door color, we can put that on there. And then we even also have knob finishes. Um, so if there was a specific knob color that needed to be on the sliding door, say for example, black, we could put that on there, come back to our walkthrough. And whenever we look at our door, we'll see it is now outlined in that white heron paint with black handles. The other next thing that we'll take a look at are windows. Now windows, um, very similar to doors. They have a very, very large variety and types of windows that you can go with, casements, um, the double hungs, all sorts, even hopper windows and things like that as well. Um, but once you kind of find the window that is gonna be accurate um, to, the, to the house that you're working on, you can go ahead and select it here. And then very similar, you can attach it to the wall. And then once it's on a wall, that's where you can again make adjustments to the dimensions. So if this window really needs to be closer to say 55 inches wide, we can make a change here. And then we can also say make an adjustment. Um, if this was a kitchen, maybe this window sits in front of a sink. Well, we're gonna need to move it up a little bit because there's gonna be cabinetry in front of it. So at that point, what we could do is say, move this up to about 42 inches off the ground. And now we're giving it plenty of clearance to be above that sink. Now, staircases and our fireplaces, these are also things where you can simply select the option that looks closest to your example um, or to the home that you're dealing with. And then go ahead and once you've selected one, you're able to go ahead and attach it or place it wherever you would need in the room. In this example, I'm not going to be using too many staircases or fireplaces, but these are all available for you to add in, and you can make adjustments to things like dimensions as well on these items um, too. So before we exit structures, there are two more important features of the structure that I wanted to also touch on. And these are two things that I personally believe give a lot of very, um, these are things that I think add a lot of credibility and also just simply make the render look a lot nicer. And those are floors and wall paint. So floors are done here by simply clicking on the floor. Uh, the floor itself will highlight blue. And then when you're in the floor plan, you can click on it and you'll see this section pop up with floors and properties. So what I need to do first is select flooring. Now we carry a very large library of tile. Um, I actually advise many designers I work with to simply search for the type of tile they're looking for because you can scroll through this uh, time and time and time again. And we, we've just imported a lot of different selections there. So if you are running with tile, I would maybe even recommend searching for something similar, uh, Moroccan or whatnot. Um, but wood flooring and carpet are a little more straightforward. And in this example, say if we have a, um, and I don't think we're gonna have a parquet floor, but say if we have an oak solid floor here, we can select that. And then once we take a look at our dollhouse, we'll see that we now have this oak floor on there. 
The last thing then that I wanted to touch on before we begin looking at products is our wall colors. Now, the walls, um, the easiest way to attach color to the walls is in the dollhouse view. And once you're in the dollhouse, you simply click on the wall. You'll recognize the same um, same adjust or types up here, size, thickness of wall. These are things that we saw in our floor plan view. Um, and again, these are things that you can, of course, adjust as needed. But the one option that does not appear in that floor plan view is the color. Um, again, we do have a partnership with Benjamin Moore on this, so they would be the, the colors that we can operate on. And if there's something that you're using outside of them, um, I'm sure you'd be able to find a very similar product within this library. But if we wanted to say have um, a you know white door or white walls, we could simply put simply white on these. And then you also can see here, paint multiple walls by holding down the shift key and selecting the walls. That's also an option. It does make it easier. Um, as long as the walls are the same color, you can simply click there, uh, hold down the shift, and it's gonna uh, make sure that that wall paint gets applied as needed. And then when you look at it again through a dollhouse or a walkthrough, we'll see here that we have our wall paint. Um, these ones I did not capture it on, so let me go ahead and put that back on there. And then once we do that, we will be all set. And um, don't be alarmed if the wall that you're putting paint on kind of highlights or almost doesn't look correct at first. When they are highlighted or when you've selected a wall, it brings a little bit more contrast and color into that photo or into that image. Um, when you click away from it, you'll see it kind of dulls down. Um, but this is the true color of that Simply White. And um, you know, at this point, we're pretty much set and can begin putting in some products. So the products uh, is the next section right here after structures. We have a couple questions, Chris, actually. Sure. If you don't mind. It sounds like we have some avid users in the room of our 3D yeah. floor planner tools. So we're so excited to hear that you guys are using it. Um, and yes, um, some questions that came out is basically every, every month, I feel like we're adding or every week almost, it feels like we're adding new stuff to the 3D floor planner. So like fireplaces, staircases, all these things are from your feedback. So definitely stay tuned because more and more is coming. Um, Kelly had specifically asked if you can go back and show how you could paint doors. Um, sure. If you that one more time, um, that would be super Absolutely. Helpful. Yeah. So um, once you've like found the door that you're wanting, I'll, I'm not going to attach this to a wall, but we can pretty much do the same ideas. Um, so we'll go ahead and just choose a plain door here. Um, once we click on the door and you highlight it, you can see things like flipping. Um, so in case you need to change things of uh, the way it's opening, the direction it's opening, you can do that. Um, but under finishes is where you would want to go. So clicking on select door finish, select paint color. And then um, once you've done that, it pops up with this little button here. And then you click that and that gets us into our library of colors. And then you can apply whatever you need to from here. Mm -hmm. I have a green door. Um, anything else, Chloe, or shall awesome. I get you. into the products? Um, no, but lots of good questions. Keep them coming. I'm trying to navigate them all, um, but keep them coming. I think we're good. Um, yes. Okay. All righty. So what we'll do next is hop into products. Um, now products thankfully are broken down by the type of room. So it does make it pretty easy to go in and navigate. Um, in this example, we're using a kitchen. So we will use kitchen products here. Um, but be aware there is a very large library of different products and um, accessories and plants and things and shelving, all sorts of things that you can add in there. Um, but once you click into, say, for example, kitchens, we're now going to start to see a little bit of a subcategory here. Now, um, I personally find it easiest to kind of begin with base cabinets, but ultimately it's kind of whatever is going to be the, the method that you prefer using there. And when you select something, say, for example, base cabinets, much like doors and our structures, this is where you start to see the renders that we have available. There are filters. So if you prefer to filter by a certain width or height or depth, you can do so. Uh, configuration is also a very common filter that I see designers use when putting together kitchens here. Um, but basically, once you say have found, um, if we want to do a two door, two drawer, we can go ahead and put that over here on the wall. And then once it snaps onto that wall, we're going to, again, have some different options here to start customizing. Now, one thing that I find very handy is that if you did select this one, but realized, oh, no, I need a 42 or a 48 inch wide, it's really easy just to click that and make that adjustment to your dimensions right here. 
Um, but below that are things like our panels and our countertops, our hardware. Um, there's a lot of things that you can add here and make this look really nice. So first thing we'll start with is panels. Um, you click onto a panel, you can select things like say if it's a shaker style or um, there's a lot of different options here. Um, but if there's anything, you know, two panel shaker, cathedral, uh, four panel, different things available. Um, but we'll get, stay fairly simple with this and do a shaker style cabinet. After that, we can then again select our finishes. We have stains. Um, I think wood stains may be coming back. We'll see. But there's also lots of colors. So to go trendy, let's go ahead and put like a, I don't know, either a forest green or a navy blue or something on these base cabinets. Um, so we'll go ahead and click over to here or here and um, we'll do this Stratford blue. After that, we can then put on a countertop. So if this countertop needs to be, for example, a, um, you know, we have granites, we have marbles, um, we have onyx, we have a lot of quartz, lots of different options. Um, but if we want to go through and just say, let's do a um, fairly simple Calcutta marble, they're alphabetically ordered and you can select it from there. And then you can also attach an edge. So if we need this to be a bevel edge, we can put that there. And then we even have the ability to, to dictate overhangs. Now, by default, seven eighths of an inch is what it's going to show up as. Um, but the usage of this overhang is very handy, especially when you're doing things like kitchen islands and you need to have a bit of an overhang that could fit bar stools under um, or things like that. Or even with some base cabinetry where there might be overhangs where like a chair can fit under. It makes it really nice and easy to put those together. And you can dictate if the overhang needs to come from front, back, left or right. And then how many inches that needs to go as well. Um, after we, we've now got our countertop in place, next thing we're going to do is take a look at our hardware. Now, um, just to stay simple, I'm going to go ahead and just choose knobs on these and cylinder. Uh, but there is a handful of other selections available. And um, once you make a selection, you can then choose the material. So if we want to go with, say, a brushed metal or a satin nickel, um, you can do so here. Chrome, pewter, plenty of options. Um, we'll just choose like a brushed metal on that. And then we'll stay similar with that cylinder and another brush metal. And at this point now, once we go back to our dollhouse and take a look, we're going to see this cabinet that we put together. And if I go to a walkthrough, I can see it just a little bit closer. Um, the next one I'm going to put together is a sink. But this is kind of just one of the things that I, I really think is nice with this tool is that once you've created it, then you can also duplicate. So now that we've put, done all this customization, in case I have some other two door, two drawer cabinets needing to go in, I can hit duplicate and go ahead and put those on wherever is needed. Um, there are corner cabinets as well. So I, for the sake of time, I'm going to probably just operate using um, some of these other ones. Um, but there are some right and different corner cabinets, which are really nice and make the designs really kind of look even better, I would say. Um, but what we're going to do is select a, a sink. Once we put that on here, at that point, then again, dimensions, style. Uh, we have farmhouse. If it's not a farmhouse, of course, you can go to something like an undermount. We have our door styles. We have our finishes. All the same things that we just looked at with that other cabinet, um, we're doing again. And we're doing these now with, oops, I don't think I chose the right color though. Stratford blue. Um, and we're doing these again because this is a different type of configured cabinet. So we do have to go in and put those changes back on. But once we've done so, I'm going to go ahead and put bevel back on. And then I'll start tidying this up in a little bit. And one thing that's also a somewhat recent development with this that I, I think is very handy is even the ability to change sink styles. So in case this isn't a single base and stake or a single base and sink, I can go through and put it to double. Being 42 inches wide, it probably or very well could be a double. Um, and then I can also adjust the faucet. So maybe this is actually more of a pull down, like more modern looking faucet that we need to have on this render. I can go ahead and make that adjustment too. Uh, now I want to pull my cabinets together a little cleaner here. And then once we've done this, we will then see our dollhouse view. And again, you would probably put in a corner, but ultimately you can start to line these up, put these in together and um, really come together with a very nice design on this. Um, some of the other pieces that are also cool within kitchens are things like islands. Whoops. 
So if you select an island, it requires, again, very similar customization to all these different tools. There's the ability to also put in things like our appliances. So if we need to put, say, a cooktop on our island, we could do so. And then another really handy tool here is that not only can you put a cooktop on, um, you also, and I would probably have this facing the other direction, you can rotate, of course, any items that you're placing. And then, of course, if for some reason, if you're, you know, we have fairly default sizes on these, um, but if you are using anything that's slightly different, you can always go in and make adjustments to our, our dimensions that we have available. Um, but things like cooktops, we have dishwashers. Um, dishwashers are super nice as well because the fact that they do, um, once you attach them to a wall, you can continue that uh, countertop on, on top. Um, that's something that many designers are very excited about is the ability to then make this all look flush as one, one piece right there. There's different refrigerators, microwaves, ranges, range gas, and then range hoods. So plenty of different appliance options available, plenty of different styles for these as well. And even within kitchens are things like wall cabinets, tall cabinets, uh, the dual microwave ovens, dual ovens, plenty of options, plenty of variety within this. And much like whenever you're putting on a window, when you're putting cabinets on the wall, one important thing to remember with your layering is that once you fix it to a wall, of course, you want to go through and make sure styles and this, you know these things are in place. But you also can double check and just make sure that you have the correct distance from the floor. Um, make sure that your elevations are looking right. And ultimately, that's one way of putting those things together. Outside of these different products, we also carry things like our source library. This has a lot of different products that are a little bit more, um, well, these are products that are actually available within our marketplace and have very detailed uh, renders available as well. So if we just needed something like a kitchen runner rug, we could simply search for something like that. And then at this point, we'll have some different options available. If there's one that we already have in mind and plan to use in the project of, and it's available on house and in here, of course, we'd plug that in. Um, but if we put something on here, at that point, we can then put it to this section of our kitchen or wherever the runner rug would go. And there's also, much like anything else, the ability to make adjustments to the dimensions. Now, this would most likely, um, you know, this is a product, so these are the real dimensions available. But in case you're using a different product from house, um, say, for example, a dining table or a couch, you can always go in and make adjustments in case you need to make those dimensions a little bit different um, for products that you're actually using. But once you have some things together, this is kind of, again, you can have your different products on here. And the next thing I wanted to actually click over to was a... Uh, 3D floor plan that I, I spent some time and kind of finished up. Um, before I go to that, let me click back to here. Um, but before I go to that, that's really the majority of some of the things I wanted to go through within this the floor plan area. Um, the one thing I was going to pull up is also, again, with plants, lighting. Those are things that whenever you've attached them, um, the ceiling light, for example, you'll see that ceiling light, any even wall art, things like that. Um, the one thing I wanted to point to is that we've also made it slightly easier to click on them. One of the feedbacks we'd had, and I certainly understood, was with difficulty, save for some of the smaller pieces, um, even ceiling lights, things like that, that it was kind of hard to click onto them. Uh, they now have this little bit larger blue bubble, and that makes it much, much easier to choose your products. Again, if you need to make adjustments, you can. Um, and then once you've really built out a larger plan, again, this is multiple rooms, you're able to present something like this to your clients. And of course, if you were to do a walkthrough, you can put yourself in the space and show it off this way. So I will be moving a little bit out of floor plans. Um, I did want to discuss a few things that are very app focused with our floor plans. Um, yeah. I did want to check with you, Chloe, anything else that I should take a look at or any anything to review really quick before we do so? Yeah, you know, there's a ton of just amazing feedback on things that you guys would love to see. Um, and we hear you. We're definitely taking note of all the different kind of 
you know, layers that you would love to see more customization, building outside, um, all those things. So we definitely hear you. Um, we're taking note of all the feedback to further improve this tool. Um, it sounds like a lot of you just use it and love it so much. Um, one other piece of feedback that we do hear relatively often is, you know, if you're like clipping items or you're finding products for your client and you want to show them like a visual rendering of it in a 3D space, it is quite tricky um, to render a 2D image into 3D. Um, so that's not something that we have yet for any image that you would clip or find or source outside. But of course, we do have them for house. Um, but again, we're, we're working on even more ways to make this really functional and bring in the technology layer. So appreciate all the feedback. But yeah. Cool. Well, I um, wanted to then really quickly navigate us over to our one piece here. Now, um, these are videos from our House Pro YouTube channel. Um, you can certainly look for these. And I do recommend just going to our channel every few weeks just to see what's new and what we're developing. Um, but one thing I wanted to point out is that this is one of the cool features of our app is that it does allow you to actually measure a space within within uh, the room using the phone. Um, so as long as you go into your app, you're able to then set points and go through and create measurements. I'm pulling up right now where measurements are being done um, through the app on a guide. And the real kind of uh, reason I wanted to focus on this is that not only are you able to go through and go to a client's house and confidently feel like you're getting measurements done without you know a tape measure, um, but once you're done building these out, these are things that then automatically sync to your House Pro. So when I was speaking earlier to the fact that on your um, House Pro 3D renders, you can duplicate, um, that's something that I do think a lot of designers take advantage of is that they can go into a space, create their measurement using the app, um, and then beyond that, once it gets the render to, is on their floor plan section, they can then duplicate it and maybe create more than one layout. Um, but it's a very handy tool. It's all iPad compliant as well now. Um, so that is one piece that I wanted to kind of highlight is just that this app, uh, the, the House Pro app allows the measuring of 3D floor plans. And then the next level of what we've done is very, very impressive, uh, in my opinion, which is the augmented reality of those plans. So this takes what we were just discussing a, almost like one more step further. So after you've gone through and done your measurements, got your room together and placed your items in, we now have an augmented reality version of the app that will allow you to go through with a client and actually while in their space, show them what that render and what that's gonna look like in real time over their existing floor plan. Um, it is a very, very cool piece of technology, as you can see here, and is something that I've uh, played around with on my own at my own house because it's just it's such a cool feature. And um, again, these are things that we've put together very kind of, I would say, snippet videos that do a very good job of explaining how to use the tool um, while also not taking a terribly long time. So these are things I would definitely look at coming back to. Um, there's some areas that our 3D floor plan team have really spent a lot of time and effort and have turned out very strongly. So this is one other step um, into the direction of what we're doing and something that you can begin incorporating with clients really as soon as possible. So at this point, I'm gonna to plan to move over to our, uh, to our mood boards and the clipper. But one more time, Chloe, just wanna check if anything else on floor plans before we move, move along. I think that we are good on the floor plans, but keep asking questions. Um, and then I know many of us were on our session yesterday where we were building documents and utilizing the clipper. Um, so some may have some context into the clipper that were here yesterday. Um, but if you want to give like a brief run through, that could be helpful. Sure. Yeah, I won't spend terribly long on this, but the clipper is a very easy tool for just navigating any vendor online. Um, I still have yet to really find a, a website that a designer's you know, provided to me that our Clipper isn't working on. Um, so just from a quick look, if we're say looking at something for a living room, um, maybe a, whatever this, you know, this thing, um, a TV stand, uh, what we would be looking at doing here is first making sure that you have the, the Clipper in, um, downloaded. So. House Pro Clipper, it's a uh, Google Chrome ex, uh, extension and it is exclusively on Google Chrome. Um, so you just basically navigate to here. Once you're there, you're able to then add on that extension. Uh, 
Um, once the extension's there, it will populate in this top corner. Now, you'll see that there is that logo here. And to take it a step further, actually, mine even has this little green button, meaning that Hallows Pro has access to the site, and it will do what's called smart clipping by default. Um, so once I log into that clipper, everything automatically pretty much just pulls in. Um, in this case, I want to go through and clear this so that we can go through it together. Um, but that is just one of the other kind of nice things that this, fu this functionality has. Um, and the smart sourcing is available on many, many websites. Um, but first thing, whenever we're in this clipper, again, we're wanting to first capture some images. So you'll notice that now that this clipper is open, the uh, uh, previous IV icon actually begins to populate on these images. So I select it here, we see it save up top. Um, now, one thing I do advise, don't try not to um, really ever grab the thumbnail photo from right here. You do want to enlarge the photo first and then clip it from right there. Um, generally, most websites do separate these as different JPEGs, different sizes, and you will end up with some blurry photos if you're grabbing them from over here. Um, but once we've said, you know, these four photos are enough for the client, next thing we can do is grab a title. Now, it is very much up to your business how you want to do the title. Um, you can obviously grab the entire, uh, entirety of it. Once you highlight, you'll start to see some of these sidebar options open up. And then you could just simply put product title. But uh, a lot of designers, especially ones that operate within markups as part of their profit, um, you know, part of the profit percentage out of their projects, I, I would really advise maybe just going with something like TV stand. Uh, less is more sometimes with that type of, with the product title. Uh, next thing we'll do is grab our cost. So again, this highlight feature makes things really easy for that. I can just highlight that and put in my cost. I can add in a markup, say if it's a 10% markup, I can put that on there. And then now tell me what my markup is. And then you can also make sure that you have the taxability of this item turned on, depending on your relation with that vendor. Below, we're then going into client description. So depending on what I want to provide the client, we can you know, grab a bit of a description for them. We can then select a category. Categories are very handy because you can get as detailed as you like with these. If you wanted to create a new category, all you have to do is start typing. You can put in TV stand and hit create. And now we would have a tag for TV stands. Anytime in the future, if I am looking in my product library, building proposals or invoices, uh, if I just want to filter by TV stands, I would see every TV stand I've ever saved. Um, but in this case, just to make it easier, I'm going to put it under furniture. Then I also can do things like vendor. So um, vendors are very much, again, something that you can create if needed. Uh, very easy to do so from the clipper itself. You just put in the company's name. And of course, if you have a trade representative within that company, um, you can put in the contacts information as well and make sure that you have the taxability of that, of that vendor uh, listed whenever you're saving them here. In this case, I've used house before, so I'm just going to simply select them. Then I can choose a project. So if I had this going into my Design Academy demo, I could put it there. And then beyond that, if I had created a room for my project, um, which I did not, but if I did create one, I could put it on there and make sure that it gets saved specifically into that room. Um, from here, dimensions, plenty of other things can be saved on, colors, finishes, materials. Um, but in this case, we'll just go ahead and save this to House Pro. Now that I've saved it, this is now going to populate um, in my product library. This will also now populate in my proposal section. So if I was to go into, say, a proposal for my um, for a project, I would be able to find the item there. So that's just a quick review of the Clipper. Um, if there's anything else on that, I can certainly spend more time on it. But um, next thing we'll be doing is looking over at our mood boards. Yeah, I think um, when you download the Clipper, maybe just to clarify for a couple of us who may be having trouble just getting it launched and getting it started, um, make sure to look for that IB leaf that's up by the URL bar. And when you click on it, it's going to prompt you to log in to the Clipper. So you can log in with House Pro. Um, you do have to enter in your credentials and then you can click go to House Pro and then you're ready to start clipping on a many, many, many websites. Uh, but if you're having any trouble, um, we're of course here to help. So just let us know um, if you're getting stuck. Yeah, I, I had already logged into it, but that is exactly right. And the other thing I would recommend, just in case you haven't done it yet, this puzzle piece is your extensions. Um, there's 
lots. I mean, there's so many ex different extensions that you could technically have within your browser. Um, one thing I find very handy is if you click on your extensions to manage them, you'll want to set a pin on your clipper uh, so that the icon is just always going to be the first thing right next to your bookmarks. So in case you haven't done that, that is one thing I would advise doing. Um, keeping it pinned just makes it a lot easier to get into it. Um, and then also, if you're already kind of like default logged into your house profile, uh, the clipper should generally um, open up with that, that profile login as well. So, yeah, good pointer. Pinning is a good one. <laughs> yeah. So next thing, um, well, next up is one of my favorite things. So I will admit as not being a like traditionally or at all trained interior designer, I don't think my mood boards look as good as a lot of the designers I work with, but I did. Um, but from a functionality standpoint, I, I know how to use it just as well. So it's just one that they are much better at design than I am. Uh, but the first thing I wanted to do is click on just the add a new mood board. Um, anytime you have previous mood boards, those will show up as well. But what we're gonna do is click add a mood board. From there, we can attach it to a project. And then from that point, we can actually even attach it into a room. So if we had a room, say if it was a living room, um, we could attach it in there. And at that, and what it will allow you to do is actually keep everything within one section of that project. What I want to do now is um, much like our floor plan. Once you've created a mood board and launched it, it's going to open a new tab. Very similar to floor plan, you can then give it a title. You can also, again, over here, do things like saving. So you can make this into a PDF. You can share it uh, by simply sharing the link. Or you can also just launch a new one. There's also some uh, quick links into some help guides. So in case you need any help within what you're doing on this mood board, you can click there and navigate to that. Printing, loading, and saving are the other three buttons up top. And that is mostly what's up here. Next up, though, we want to go kind of across this way. So what I want to do is to begin with a photo. And what this is, is allowing you to basically access your own photo library. So in case you didn't maybe pull in products and have them in your library, um, say if you didn't have, you know, if you weren't, if you didn't have the product clipped, or if it's something where maybe you have the, a photo, uh, maybe it's artwork, or it's something that you simply have an image of that you can upload yourself, that's what this is for. And it allows you to get as detailed as you need. Uh, and then the other default is gonna be idea books that populates there. And that allows you to pull in idea books in case you've been collaborating with a client um, you know, using the profiles idea books, you can add those in as part of what you're doing. Over here is our floor plan. So in case I did want to show them, you know, maybe I have a floor plan here that I want to put on here. I can actually drop that into one of the corners or wherever I like within my mood board and have that available for them to look at um, as part of the different um, offerings or options that will be available for them to see in the mood board. This is a very handy one for color. So if we were, again, doing some of that white heron, I can, I can type that in. Once I have it typed in, I'm just selecting it and I'm going to choose to add a swatch. That is what is going to put our swatches on here. And we can, you know, add as many as you need. So if uh, maybe it's white and gray for some of the stuff you're doing in this room, you can put different swatches on and you can even detail a little bit further in case you wanted to add in your own text, you could put in, uh, maybe this is the trim color. Oops. And I need to center that a little more. And then I can put in next to here, maybe this is our wall color. Maybe it'd look better if it's the other way around. But either way, you would you can have these different things placed on. This is your select button. It's very similar to select on floor plan. It's the one that will allow you to do the most um, just kind of navigation throughout the mood board. And then one other piece that's available here are things like our draw tool, shape tool, and rulers. I'll try to come back to those a little bit as we get some products added on here. But ultimately, these are really just so that you can, again, organize, put in if you need to show an 8 by 11 rug and put some measurements on, things like that, um, the width or length of a, a window treatment, you can put those type of things on there. Yeah. We do have a question, Chris. Um, sure. We do currently only have a partnership with Benjamin Moore, but we are exploring others. However, when Chris clicks on one of those swatches, if you're just trying to give like inspiration on the color, 
You can hide the swatch detail if you're choosing to work with like a different type of vendor or supplier. Um, you can still use it kind of for that inspirational piece. Um, but yes, more to come on other partnerships, but currently just Benjamin Moore. Yes. And thank you for yeah pointing that out. This this button here is what allows you to turn on or off the, the detail on that swatch. Mm -hmm. So now that I'm in my mood board, I'm going to start maybe throwing some different products on uh, and just exploring a little bit of the features that are available within the items or images that you attach. So one thing is that our product list, again, these would be products that we're pushing, putting onto the mood board. Also products that would be saved through like a clipper, things like that. Um, our library is going to default with the first thing that you're going to see as a logo. Um, I chose the Best of House logo. I, um, if you know whatever logo you have as a business, you can of course put that on here and put it in the top right corner, uh, or wherever you feel like it belongs on the mood board. Um, but that's one other item that you can attach. And as long as your account settings are put together correctly, your logo will always show up here as the first option. Uh, but after that, let's go ahead and start putting some products on. So say if we wanted to put on a sofa, I could click on a sofa, put it where I kind of feel like it belongs on the screen. And then I can also do things like minimize. Um, by clicking the corners, you can adjust the size and dimensions. Clicking the um, circle is what actually allows us to tilt. So in case we need to make this a different uh, orientation, essentially we can do that as well. And then beyond that, we have things like duplicate, flip, which just kind of flips the image, cropping. So if we needed to, we can crop the image. Um, our one really nice thing about this software is that it does include a restore and remove background. So this item that I clipped, I did deliberately clip it with a white background um, just because it does still always look the cleanest if you are pulling images with um, white backgrounds. But in case there is a background to the photo, um, our software is going to do its best to try to block out as much of that as possible while leaving in that furniture piece for you. Skewing is something that we'll do here in a second with like a rug. Um, but skewing is what really gives you a very easy ability to put some dimensions onto or some dimension to the photo. Um, give it almost more of a, a real life or 3D perspective. Um, so we'll look at that in a moment. And then back and front just allows you to place different items on front on top of each other, essentially. So if we were to, again, maybe, yeah, if we were seeing to use this sofa, next thing I can do is also not only do I have my own library, we do have the handy house source library as well. So if I needed to find like an area rug here, just type that in, can grab the one I want. And at that point, I can begin to kind of layer this so that the rug is going to be underneath this um, the sofa. Now, I personally always will kind of set up my product this way first. Um, now that it's actually covering it, that's one place that I'll start to use the back button. So I can drop this on top. And once it's on top, now we can begin to skew. Skewing um, will allow us to, again, make some changes. And once you click skew, you'll see that the four corners of this image are highlighted. I kind of view it as best if you're going into a trapezoid, which I'm pretty certain this is, um, where you sort of drop down some of these corners and then basically bring up the front of it. I think that's a trapezoid. And basic, if you're even more skilled than me, you can certainly make these look a lot more realistic. Um, but it is just, again, a good way of kind of giving your client a feel for how this is going to look when these products are actually together. Uh, not all mood boards, do you have to use SKU? Um, but it is a function and that's kind of the, the goal with our that software is to allow you to do something very similar to this. And from there, you can of course build out a larger room if we need to have this much bigger. Um, we of course could put coffee tables on, um, we could add in other chairs, things like that, and really start to put this together. Um, but you will still see things like how this, the floor, uh, the carpet, or the rug uh, goes through these different spots. Uh, again, that's that background feature. And it does a very, very good job again with the white backgrounds, especially of getting that cleared up. Uh, now there are plenty of other ways that designers put, these, put things together with this. If you wanted to add window treatments, other items in. Um, but for today, I really just wanted to make sure that from a more of an operational standpoint that it's a very understood product. Um, not so much the quality of my actual design, um, but any questions really within the, the way that this is kind of working, I just want to make sure that uh, 
you know, from a functionality standpoint, everyone has a really good grasp on this. I think so far so good. Yes, that was very helpful. I think it did actually answer a lot of questions for the audience. So wonderful. Perfect. And um, again, as you build out these mood boards, you do automatically get a product list that does get created from them. Uh, and then the product list will also include things like a running total of what our costs are. Uh, the one thing is I did unfortunately add the same product multiple times. So I kind of messed up our system with that. Uh, but you, again, can always kind of clean that up, just take out your quantities and, and make that look a little bit better. Um, but yeah, overall, it's a very, very commonly used tool. And the only last thing I wanted to leave off on is that there's plenty of designers that I work with who also kind of feel like the background, just this, this very, very white background to begin with is um, uh, just something that they would prefer to not use. Uh, so essentially, if you needed to, you can always customize that. If you just want to make it a slightly warmer shade of white, you know, you can always kind of click around and, and do what you feel like is going to look better on the back. Or if you would prefer, oh, and let me take my background out so my logo blends in. Um, or if you'd prefer, you of course can just go into a Benjamin Moore and select a color from there. Um, and that takes some of the guesswork out. But the backgrounds themselves are customizable. So if you feel like that needs to be updated, you certainly can. Um, and that's really about it with the mood boards. The, again, the help section here has a lot of good walkthroughs and tutorials. Uh, and then here in a second, what we'll do is move over to our time and expense. Cool. We do have one question from Renata. Would you mind going back to the product list on the mood board and kind of explaining exactly how it pulls that information in one more time? Sure. So the product list um, develops as you add in the items to your mood board. So this item, um, now I did earlier, I, when I was kind of, I couldn't really get the item straight. I messed up on something with that. So I deleted it and I added it back on. That's why we see the multiples. What you would do is basically put in the zero quantity to begin taking some of those out. Uh, you'll see the total here reflects with that. Uh, but any item you're adding on rugs, coffee tables, um, the sofa, the love seat thing, um, these different swatches, all of these things will populate uh, mm -hmm. into our product list as we build this up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And some of you are asking questions like, can I build a proposal from here? Like what happens with that list? Um, so I'm going to give you a sneak peek into something that's not quite ready yet, um, but I think we'll answer a lot of your questions that you have. Um, and then separately, Raphael just asked a question too. Um, what would be the best way to create like multi-page presentations or can mood boards be duplicated? So that's actually a great question. I've, um, there's not as of right now, an option in terms of building a deck um, for these, like, like essentially like slides. If you wanted three or, you know, an option where you had a, uh, like a sectional with um, one chair versus a normal couch and you have two, two different accent chairs and a coffee table and, those type of things. You do want to actually go back out and just originate new mood boards. You'll still want to attach them to the same projects and to the same rooms, but um, but ultimately you do have to actually generate two different options of essentially for your client, and then you would be sharing um, you'd be sharing two separate links with them as well. Great, thank you. Yeah, um, but that is. Um, that is definitely a very good question and something I think that um, might be changing. Who knows? But let's see. So I'm going to move over to, let's see. So we're going to get out of our mood boards um, and take a quick look into our time and expense. So once I do that, I'm over. Um, what I want to do is move out of our design area where we spent most of our call. Now in design, uh, 3D floor plans, mood boards. Again, those are the different items up here. Uh, and then we also have our own library. So you can shop and house. The idea books are also attached up here as well. Um, but what we're going to be going over to is now our manage button. So underneath manage, there's several very handy things, clients, vendors. Uh, what we're going to focus on next is going to be our time and expense, which is right underneath the financial reporting. And once we're in time and expense, you get brought to this section here. So time and expense is very handy because it allows quite a bit of filtering and quite a bit of um, you know, kind of customization on, the, on your side as to how you want to set these services up um, and bill. So I just to speak through, we have our time section here. We have our expense section here. To be able to generate entries, you just click the blue new entry button on either one. 
And then one other thing that's uniform between the two is the managed services. So managed services is where we'll begin. We'll start with that on the time section, and then we'll look at managed services on expense. After that, we'll then go into some of these other filters. Um, so when we're looking at managed services, this is something that, especially for designers that have a slightly larger firms, um, associate or junior designers that work with them, it's a very easy way if you're um, putting in time entries to make sure that those are going to be accurate. So what you do is click on manage expense, manage uh, the services. And from there, you can create or put together whatever services you need. Um, by clicking new service, that allows you to put in the team member that it's for. It's going to allow you to type in what the service is, you know, uh, sourcing, uh, in-person in consultation, color consulting, whatever it is. You can put those on. And then you can attach whatever that hourly rate is. Um, you can determine the taxable and billableness of this. Um, many of these we would be taking the tax off. And then once you save it, it's going to become part of this list. Um, so each team member, each designer can all have their own specific list. And whenever you're creating entries for them, they, whatever um, entry you're doing will generally fall or stem from this list initially. And then, of course, if you ever need to edit something, maybe your design rates have gone up. Uh, inflation's going up like crazy, so maybe some rates have gone up as well. Um, you can always come in here, put in an adjustment, put save. Moving forward, all time entries will then calculate to this price point. Under expenses, it operates very similar uh, in a very similar manner. Uh, you have the team member filter up top here and the new service button right there where you can type in what you need. So samples, fabric samples, reimbursements, travel, things like that are different examples, but there's plenty of more of expense or of different services and expenses you could be building for. Um, and then once you generate your expense, much like time, uh, the new entry is where you'd be able to create that. So before we do generate our first entry here, what I want to click to is that number one, you can always filter and take a look at your entries by team members. So if you need to go through and take a look at different entries, um, you can always do it by either yourself or the other team members you have. You can also filter by dates. So within the past week, within the past month, you can take a look at your time entries. Uh, and by default, it's going to show all of them. So it's going to have a very, very long list of entries that you can look at, uh, depending on how how long you've been on house, um, but it does keep everything stored as well as then also giving you some quicker snapshots. And then last thing is actually the ability to filter by service. So if you need to take a look and see how many, you know, make sure that you're getting the amount of travel expense or the amount of design rate or things of that nature put together here, um, you of course can go through and filter by that and pull up every entry that you put that is in that one service type. Now, what we're going to do is just create a time entry. Um, so to do so, we're going to hit new entry here. We're going to go down and select our project. After we've selected the project, we're going to go ahead and choose the team member. Uh, we'll go with myself on that. And then we'll go ahead and put in our, our what were our services. So in this case, we'll do design rate. Um, that 225 that I adjusted it to is what does populate here. We're going to say that it's from the 12th for today. And then what we can do is put in how many hours. So if that was for maybe a three hour uh, consultation or a three hour rate that we need to bill for, I can put that on. And there is the ability to put in description. So if you needed to add in some descriptions, um, those are great usage of like internal notes, uh, as well as in descriptions that can be put on the invoice if needed. So if you need to provide a little bit of a description to the client, you type it in there. And once you generate an invoice, it would appear there as long as you've turned the descriptions on. Uh, and then below that is upload files. So if you have a file that you have to put on, um, this is where you would do it. But once you've saved, we're now going to see our new entry is going to be the one populating at the very top here. So that is how the entries are made. Expenses follow the exact same flow. Um, so I don't need to double up our time on that because I want to make sure that we have time to get through the task and timeline as, and reporting as well. Uh, but once we have our time entry put together, all I have to do is click on it. Um, if it's grayed out, that means that this has already been billed, by the way. So what we would do is click on this. Now, once we've clicked it, our create invoice button has now came to life. And all I have to do is hit create invoice and House Pro will basically take care of that for me. Um, I now have my invoice. I now have my ability to put my payment on it, all the things that you reviewed yesterday, and can get that sent out and paid. 
The um, only other thing with this that I was going to mention is that you can, of course, choose icons or things like that. Um, but that's how many time entries are generated. And then the other piece I wanted to show under time and, ex time and expense, other than generating an invoice in that manner, is the stopwatch. Uh, if you're not familiar with the stopwatch, stopwatch is a very detailed way to come up with time. If you want to have timestamps and be extremely precise instead of just rounding to three hours like I did, you can go ahead and start the stopwatch. It will ask you what project you're wanting to create the stopwatch for. It will ask you things like, what is the service? Uh, and then once you start it, it begins a rolling clock. Uh, when you're all done, you can hit log time. It's going to populate like a line item, much like the one we created ourselves manually. And then we can attach that to an invoice. Uh, you can, of course, add as many time entries and build up larger invoices than just the one entry. Um, but for today, I just wanted to make sure that we did see how that's done. And I'll go ahead and exit out of the stopwatch. But stopwatch and or the new manual entry, those are the two different ways that you can do it. And one nice thing is that now team members also have access to this time reporting. So if you have dedicated members of your team who need to be managing time, submitting time entries, um, they'll be able to do so um, as well as the administrative email on file. Yes, and you can actually even run multiple stopwatches at the same time, too. So if you're, I don't know, there could be a lot of scenarios to use this. Maybe you're sourcing and doing another thing. You can start and stop multiples um, and, of course, use them for team members. So really helpful. Yeah, and all team members, like, yeah, you'll at times hop into a profile and many team members will have stopwatches running at once. So, yeah, it's built for multiple functionality on that. Great. All right. Well, let's hop in now to our projects. So we've spent some time looking at our time and expense. Uh, now what we're going to do is actually hop into a project and take a look at our task. Now, tasks are very, very handy for keeping organized. Um, so there's a few things I wanted to do before we get um, too far into a task. So the first thing I wanted to point out is that we do have the ability here to simply click projects task and pull up a master list of every open task that I currently have, as well as every completed task that I've put in. Um, before I want to get too far in that, I want to show how a task is made because this probably won't make a ton of sense yet until you actually do see a task get generated. So what we're going to do is go into one of my projects here. And what you'll notice off the bat is that um, actually, I'll go into my other project because it might get confusing calling that one timeline. Um, what you'll notice off the bat uh, and what I get questions on is that tasks are not actually their own tab. Tasks are the overview and tasks exist underneath the messages. So to create a task, this is one of the places you can do it. Um, you can create them here as well. But within a project, if you were to come in here and create a task, you can put in what it need, you know, whatever that task needs to be. Maybe it's a uh, measure clients living room um, initial consult once you put that on you can save it and then task once you've generated a task is when you can measure or when you can actually go through and manage it so i can click on my task i can set things like a due date i can assign it so if this needs to be assigned to a team member maybe i have um, a team member who's going to be going out and doing the measuring i can assign it to them or if it's something I need to assign to the client, I can do that as well. I can put a date on there. I can actually share this and put visibility of this task on my timeline if I choose to as well. And if needed, I can also put in a description. Uh, but once I've put in my details, you'll see things like our due date populate. There's more that now is available within this task. And when it's finished, I can hit the little check mark. And then at that point, it converts into a completed task. Um, the really handy thing, in my opinion, is that this, if you were to click on projects and choose task here, that's what takes us to here. And this is a master list of every task, like I mentioned earlier. So if I have four projects running at once and I have 10 tasks on each project at the moment, um, as opposed to having to navigate into each one individually and looking at what I have going on, I would then just see all 40 of them right here. And um, at that point, I can then again, if I need to, I can delete or I can click on it and manage it and see if there's anything else that needs to be done with that task before completing it. Um, goal is to get these moved over from 
the open area to our closed area. And whenever it comes to task, especially if you had say 40 or even 27 here, um, you can also make filters in terms of how we're sorting them. If we're pulling them up again, you can you can technically can filter by projects. Um, filter by assignee is something I hear a lot of designers like being able to do. And then also um, the reporters on these tasks you can pull up. So there's some different ways to pull this info up. Uh, you can sort by newest task. You can sort by the due date of those tasks. Um, you know, if they're if they go over late, it will tell you like these have. Um, but otherwise, it will keep you in track of how close you are to that due date being done or how close it is to you. So that's kind of a quick look, but tasks in general um, really are meant so that you can organize them and they are also available within the app. So those are some things to keep an eye on um, with the task. Um, any Anything there, Chloe, that you'd like me to take a further look into? I think that actually some of the questions may be answered in what you'll review next with the timeline um, okay. because they're asking about creating dependencies. Um, and making templates. Um, templates for timelines are actually coming soon. Um, but uh, if you're wanting to create dependencies and kind of see kind of a cool, more maybe detailed Gantt chart, um, that's something that Chris will show you. Yep. Cool. So looking like tasks are pretty good. Let's go over to our timeline. So that is also something that is available within the project. So right now, what I'm looking at is I went to my Design Academy project that we've been in earlier. Once I navigate there, it does have its own sidebar. So timeline is right there. Or I can also um, go into it from upcoming events either way. But timeline is right there. And what I want to do is first click on or show just the way that this defaults. Um, we will start making adjustments to our items and we'll start titling them and we can create dependencies and sub items, all those good things here in a second. Um, the first thing I was going to mention within this timeline is that it is something that is meant to be shared um, if you choose to. And by that, there is a two point, I almost view it as like a two point authentication process to make sure it gets shared properly, um, but also to make sure that you're not accidentally sharing something with a client um, when you don't want to. So right up top here, this is one of the first questions I always get about timelines. Ta when you click share right here, this is what's going to allow you to create your accesses. So if you want your client to have access on their dashboard, you can turn on either basic or detailed access. Now, uh, detailed is going to give them also um, sub items, dependencies, views into everything. Basic is just going to show them the items that you've created. Um, so you can determine what access you want them to have. And then you can also um, vent, give it to vendors and then vendors get just the detailed access by default. Um, so you can add vendors on uh, or you can add it or, you know, subs, vendors or clients can be added by clicking the share button. But once you've clicked that and turned it on, you still actually have to share the dashboard to the client and able for, to um, allow them to see the timeline. So the share here, give them access, and then you can share it there. And that way you make sure that the client has that dashboard. Um, but in this case, um, what we're going to look at next, and that's how you can invite subs in, is that invite sub button. Um, Beyond that, there are, you know, assignees, so you can assign thing or have assignees populate uh, and apply and filter by that. You can also filter over here by open complete status of, pro of different items. Um, so as you get through items, you're actually able to move their status to complete. Um, and then you can always look back and filter by items that you've already closed out. Last thing here um, before we get too much further along is going to be our Gantt view. Uh, there is a Gantt view or a calendar view. So depending really on how you like looking at this, um, you can go in and, and make adjustments to it. Um, I'll be doing mostly Gantt view for today's call, but uh, or for today's like going through this. But if there is anything needed, just let me know because I can always switch up to calendar. Um, and then the last thing here is the blue button for adding items. It defaults with three items, but you generally are going to have to add more um, by clicking add item. You'll see that it automatically saves and places that item on our on our uh, chart here for us. So let's go here and get our Gantt view started. So I always kind of view it easiest to just click on our items. Once you do, you get our this uh, small window opening up. 
And this is where we can begin to actually change and make adjustments to it. So if this item, instead of being item one, needs to be, um, you know, planning phase or something, we can do that. Add a location if needed. So if I have a sub item, maybe measuring at the client's house, I can, of course, put in clients, you know, residence here. Description. So if I did have some details or description I wanted to put on there, I could. And um, especially if I was assigning this to a to a colleague and I needed them to be able to kind of know exactly what I wanted, I could put a description in there. Um, below the assigning and descriptions is our time section. So by default, it's always going to show up as all day. But if you're doing, say, like a um, maybe you're just doing flooring removal as phase one of something um, and you need to go in and put in that that's really only going to be six hours. You can, in, you know, it's going to be from, say, I guess I should have chosen an easier number, but like nine to three. Um, what you would be able to do is basically select our date and then our, our windows here and our working hours. But um, if it's if it's fine, you can just leave it as all day and just put working days down as your as your filters there. And um, next thing we're going to do is also show how you can make adjustments. If we need the planning phase to be 15 days long, I can either click on here. I can go in and put down till the 20, um, you know, 27th. Or if I need to, I can go in and just put in 15 working days. And at that point, oh, just getting 15 working days till June 1st. Good thing I did it this way. Um, but that's kind of how you can also make adjustments to the different phases and the lengths of those. And then here is what uh, it sounds like everyone wanted to see, which is our dependencies. So there's actually two different ways of creating dependencies. If Say if we have an item two and it can't really begin until item one is finished, we could either go in here and put that, you know, these this one is going to create the end before, meaning that item two is required to be finished before you can really get into that. Um, one other really kind of... Personally, I think it's just kind of a cool feature is that if you don't want to do it this way, you can also click and move it down. Whoops, I missed. And put it on right there. And that's the same thing. So it's going to also create a dependency. So you can either kind of click them and move them down and create them this way, or you can assign the dependencies up top here. Uh, task, again, if, if you have any sort of like organization behind it, you can, of course, color um, color code these different tasks. So if that makes things easier, if there's certain ways that you operate and having color on these different tasks helps, you can do that and put those in. And then sub items is the next piece I wanted to touch on real quick. So um, I think I went pretty vague as my planning phase. Um, so if I wanted to put in some subs here, make this kind of a little bit more built up, uh, what I can do is then add in a new sub item. So a sub item for this could be, um, you know, as I think I said earlier, like measuring. Uh, space. Um, maybe I have my measure space on. Uh, you know, again, I could assign that to somebody if I needed to. Uh, now measuring space, that's only going to take maybe, uh, you know, one day really. Um, at that point, I can put that on there. I can assign a dependency to it. So if I need that to have something like that, I could do it. But otherwise, um, this is mostly just putting those on and you can assign as many sub items as needed. Um, and sub items also can, uh, as you can see, kind of shift down and move a little bit of our items here within our Gantt chart. Um, so if I had, say, for another sub item, something like, you know, we've already measured the space. Now this sub item is going to be more so for, let's see, I thought I clicked a new one. Uh, sub item two. So sub item two here, if this needs to be a 3D render, um, I can go ahead and put that on there. We can say that that's going to be something that we'll have kind of starting a little bit later. So maybe closer to like the 17th. And instead of 15 working days, that's about three working days. Um, I can put that on. Now, if I'm wanting this to start right after this one, I don't want to wait till Monday. I want to just get to work. I can always move things over. So this is also another functionality here is that you can click and drag and move these. Um, and also in case you're running into delays, I mean, this is pretty much the... Um, you know, we're, we're thick into like projects, unfortunately, not following the timelines we're hoping for at times. So if we need to stretch things out, if we have delays in shipping or in product uh, being manufactured, you can always go into these timelines and just move whether the phase needs to be elongated or if we need to actually make adjustments to um, sub items or things like that. 
Um, but there's certainly flexibility within here. Um, and you can build these out to be significantly larger as they go through. Um, that's kind of just quickly looking through items and subs and dependencies. And I wanted to make sure that sharing it was also something that was kind of um, touched on as well. Amazing. But, Thank you, Chris. Um, we sure. did also get a question when we were talking about sharing the timeline to the client dashboard. Um, you can also, of course, uh, have tasks appear in the client dashboard too. So as Chris mentioned, some of the tasks you actually might assign to your client, they can appear there as like that one-stop shop to find everything that they need so they don't have to bug you and text you on the weekends and late at night. Um, so that is something that you can incorporate in the dashboard as well. Um, Absolutely. And also within your your um if you really want it on your timelines um some of the tasks we were just looking at so if we had a um you know one of the tasks i think i created right let's see if we you know whenever we're putting in a task i'll just do it this way then um once we've generated a task once we assign a due date on it I can then put that on the timeline as well. Yeah. So you do have to create a date, but once you've done that, you can share it. And then that is also going to be data that gets converted into our, um, our timeline here. So tasks can also get saved in. Amazing. Thank yep. you so much. Sure. Okay. And the last piece I have is reporting. So I did, I want to get through that so that Chloe can go through some updates. Um, so I, I'll try to kind of roll through this relatively quickly. Um, and basically with the reporting, um, we're back in our managed bar, uh, nav and just right above time and expense is financial reports. Now um, there's, you know, for this, I just kind of want to speak through some of the reports that we offer. Um, the details on these are actually um, available within the report section, uh, but we do carry a payment report. This is an incoming and outgoing payment um, report that shows invoiced and remaining liabilities, POs, uh, and kind of pulls from a lot of that data and gives you very good snapshots into like where you're at with your, honestly, with both in incoming and outgoing expenses. The tax liability report, um, essentially, as long as you know you have your tax fields correct in your account settings and you're uh, uh, putting your items in correctly with your taxes, this is a report that's going to generate how much money you're owing the government in sales tax. This was the um, this was the report I probably got the most questions about in the last month because of the uh, April fifteenth tax date. So this is a you know a couple times a year this becomes really important. Otherwise, the tax report is right there though. Um, transactions. This is actually a little bit different than your income reporting. Um, transaction report is actually breaking down all the payments and incoming, um, basically uh, like the money that's coming in via either Stripe in our system or if you're manually logging. Um, but it, it allows you to go through and see like invoices, um, any real incoming documents. You can see payments that are done on proposals as well there. Um, and it also allows just different breakdowns. If you need to see things like markups or things like that, you can generate that type of reporting. Outgoing transactions, um, you do want to make sure you're being diligent on your purchase orders to make sure this, this report reflects correctly. Um, but this is going to pull from a lot of that data and it's really your outgoing expenses um, and gives you an idea again of where kind of where your money's going. Um, some vendors I work with like to, or some designers I like to work with, uh, they really value this report because uh, it gives them an idea of how much they're spending with certain parties um, or also kind of helps them forecast in the future if there's ways that they can kind of generate a little better profit um, within projects. And then the last two here are general time billing. Um, so this is a report that's going to pull time billing entries um, based on team members or on projects. And, um, and really that's the majority of what that section has. It's just going to pull um, reporting from the time and expense section there. So I know I went through that relatively quickly, um, but I did want to make sure that you had some time here, Chloe, for any updates you had. Uh, but before I switch off anything else on reporting that you had questions on? You know, while we have your screen up, um, what I'm going to talk to you guys about is um, kind, of, kind of keep it up with all the newness of how. So if you've been with us for a minute, you'll see that there's updates that are constantly coming out. And very much so like this session today where you're providing us all this amazing feedback. That's probably things that we're going to end up implementing in the product. So how do you know when new things are launching? So, um, Chris, if you wouldn't mind maybe hovering over the icon on the top right, 
um, and showing them that what's new in House Pro is um, one great resource to keep your eye on. So we try to be very diligent on publishing here things that you may need to know about, improvements into the product, of course, and also sending you some email updates every now and then. And then separately, I know that we've talked a bunch about that help tool where you can reach out to us again if you need help above and beyond like today's session. You can chat with us, search our help center, et cetera. Um, but high level, I did want to run through a couple things that are on the roadmap for you. Um, so you do have kind of a sneak peek and I'll show you one other thing that I think I'll be really excited about. Um, but just a couple things that we've reviewed so much, um, but wanted to name a couple. So business partner access, if you have kind of a, a right hand that is coming very, very soon to have very similar permission sets um, with the admin account. Um, separately sending invoices to leads in addition to just proposals. Um, we're also very mindful of making your, your process of accessing House Pro out in the field, um, something that is very much similar to being on a desktop experience. So more iPad functionality is coming. Um, duplicating products. This is actually a feedback that I remember came in a previous session when you're clipping products and maybe you want a queen version and a king version of a bed. That is also coming soon. Um, e-signatures for designers on documents, not just your clients, that is coming. I mean, like I mentioned, some templates for timelines and having floor plans assigned to a project. All those things are coming, coming very, very soon. So um, I hope you guys are looking forward to those. But Chris, if you wouldn't mind actually stopping your screen share, I'll also give them kind of a high level glimpse into something we are super excited about here at House. Um, this is actually one of my first times seeing this too. But for some of our customers who have been with us since the Ivy days, um, many of you kind of knew and loved our room board feature. Um, and that is something we are bringing back into the House Pro experience, but even better. So um, I'd love to just kind of take the opportunity to, again, you guys can have some of the first eyes on this really exciting um, tool that we will have here launching very soon. Um, but let's take a look. All right, so I'm going to kind of run through some different screens here as far as the designs. Um, but for our living room, um, this is a sample of a room board. So you can see how you can kind of start building your concepts is the call out here within a project. And here you can add in all those different product items that maybe you have purchased. Um, you can see as you're kind of building things along, you have the opportunity to have clients interact with you and engage if they want to approve or decline items being very transparent on the budget um, that you have set aside for this room. You can, of course, also look into adding in your floor plans, your color palette, your mood boards. So having kind of one inspirational hub before you get into sending that financial documents that you may um, be sending out moving forward. So this is going to be a really exciting addition where you have a lot of different customizations and ability to interact and engage with your clients in the way that you want. Um, but we've received lots of great feedback on these tools in the past, and they're getting even more comprehensive. So something really exciting to look forward to that is coming soon. Um, but we, again, just wanted to kind of give you a sneak peek into those things. So I hope that that is a, a helpful thing for you to see what's on the horizon. Um, all right. So let me see. Uh, let me make sure that there's any final questions in here that I can help answer before we go. Yes, we are absolutely sending a recording of today's session um, out to you guys. So we'll probably end up sending all three. So if you happen to miss one, you can, of course, get caught up on the account settings, the teams, how to add different details, working with our lead management tool, and then the whole project deep dive that we did yesterday on proposals, documents, etc. Um, all that will be coming your way very, very soon. Um, but we hope that you guys enjoyed this session this week with us. I know that we absolutely have, and I hope you got a lot of value from it. Um, but if you do need us, don't forget to use those help options, and we are here to help you. So hope you all have a great afternoon or evening, wherever you are. And thank you, Chris, so much for your thorough demonstration of all those things within House Pro. Yes, thank you. All right. We'll see you guys.